Good evening, everyone. My name is John Taves, and I'm the event coordinator at McNally Robinson Booksellers in Winnipeg. We're broadcasting tonight from Treaty One territory, the traditional territory of the Anishinaabeg, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, the homeland of the Métis Nation. We're gathered here tonight virtually to celebrate the launch of Signal Decay by Keith Kaju, published by At Bay Press. Just a few quick housekeeping notes before we get underway. As soon as I'm gone, uh, your host for the evening and our featured author will be up here. Uh, there'll be a reading followed by a conversation between the two of them, following which you'll have the opportunity to put any questions you might have to keep by means of the Q&A box. Uh, so you'll notice that just at the bottom of the screen, there is a Q&A box. Uh, please feel free to press that button and write in any questions you might have for Keith. Rest assured that uh, you will not interrupt us while doing so. So feel free to just write them in as they occur to you. Please also feel free to chat amongst yourselves uh, in the chat and offer any comments or uh, any words that you might have for the author or the host this evening. After uh, this event is over, I'll be sharing the chat with them so they'll see any comments that you might have made. Being a bookseller, it behooves me to mention the fact that books are available for sale. Uh, Keith very kindly signed many copies of Signal Decay for us uh, at the store. So those are available. You can get in touch with us either uh, in person, uh, for right now at least, or you can give us a call and uh, you can also order online. We, um, we can ship books nationally and internationally. We can mail them within the province. And we also have a courier service for within the city. So one way or another, we will get a copy of Signal Decay to you. I'd also like to offer a sincere thanks to At Bay Press who published this book and uh, gave us a reason to gather here this evening. And uh, of course, thanks to them for all their help with the organization of this event as well. But that is more than enough for me right now. I will introduce your featured author and the host for this evening. So, Keith Kidu is a Winnipeg-based writer and editor. His debut, the novella Gaze, was shortlisted for a Manitoba Book Award and a Relit Award. He co-edited the horror anthology, The Shadow Over Portage in Maine, which was also shortlisted for a Manitoba Book Award as well as the Phantasmagoriana series, published by the Winnipeg International Writers' Festival. His short fiction has appeared in various Canadian fiction venues, including Grain, Prairie Fire, and ELQ, and has been translated into French. Two short stories of his, Stuck and Donner Parties, have appeared on the Honorable Mentions list of the Best Horror of the Year series, edited by Ellen Datlow. He lives with his partner, the incredible musician, Lindsay, and a big dog, named Bear. Host Sayward Goodhand's stories have been shortlisted for the Writers' Trust, McClelland and Stewart Journey Prize, and a National Magazine Award, and longlisted for the CBC Short Story Prize. Her first collection of stories, the incredible collection, Even That Wildest Hope, was a finalist for the Manitoba Book Awards, Margaret Lawrence Award for Fiction, and the Eileen McTavish Sykes Award for Best First Book and long listed for the 2020 Sunburst Award for Excellence in Canadian Literature of the Fantastic. She has a PhD in English from the University of Toronto. Please join me in welcoming Keith Kaju and Sayward Goodhand. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi, Keith. Um, it's a... <laughs> How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. I'm good, thanks. It's great to um, be here. Keith and I are in a writing group, and so I'm uh, I'm particularly happy to be here with you, Keith, to help you um, to launch this um, very moving and uncanny story about grief, technology, and um, the mystery of an, of another person is what this feels like to me. You know, how who are these people we spend our lives with? <laughs> Do we know them? <laughs> um, you know, what are we left with if they um, when when they leave? You know. Um, and so you're going to do, um, and thank you to everyone who's here as well. Um, I see your numbers and the participants, and I'm, you know, mm. I'm, I'm glad to have you here. And I'll be keeping my eye on the Q and A if you have, um, if you have uh, questions that you want to ask uh, throughout. Um, so you're going to do a reading in a moment, Keith. Um, but before you do, I thought you might like to take an opportunity um, to introduce people uh, to the form of this story, Signal Decay, a chapbook story. People who might not be familiar with chapbooks, um, who might not have picked up a chapbook story before. It strikes me as I, I really love this form. It's a really um, 
strikes me as a really hopeful form, um, a real labor of love. I have a, a chapbook story as well. So for, for people who might not be familiar with this form, what is a chapbook story and what do you like about this form? Sure, this is, um, well, it's, it's in this particular is at Bay's sort of initiative where they have uh, they have the From the Heart series, which are all sort of smaller chapbook size. And so I, they play a lot with different kinds of genres and forms in, in that short little, short little book. So like, you can just see that it's just a teeny little thing. Um, so they have ones that are uh, songs and poetry uh, at, as well as artwork. So there's um, some paintings mixed in there as well. Uh, it, it's my first um, dabbling in such a short, short form. So like I have done short stories that have been included in uh, anthologies or magazines or like where they're, they're grouped together. And I'm with you that it is interesting to have something um, sort of digestible all on its own that is just this nice short form. I think there's some really interesting things that can be done with, with something there that where it is so, so small and uh, where like our, our biggest hope for our short stories is they would have a kind of emotional punch or that they, they would stay with you. And I think having it just as it's a little book on its own actually really serves that purpose well, that um, once you're done, you can just sort of close it and put it down. You're not distracted by, oh, there's, there's a whole table of contents here to get through. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I, I would say that is is like a something about the form that I I really find very interesting, and I'm I'm glad that at bay is uh, is taking the chance on on producing these right because they are something where like that's sort of at the whims of the publisher who wants to to experiment with what they print and put out, and so I would I would applaud them and champion their they're from the heart series and very yeah me too of. me too i think and i think you're right i think that's a really um i think you're right i think that it does feel like a, a complete whole um you know entity that has a lot of presence because it's in this form and uh the, the paintings that i might we might talk about this a little bit later but the paintings that are uh, throughout the story really add a lot of emotional resonance too um but I think you should. Uh, I think you should tantalize everyone with um, a reading, a reading sure. from Simone Decay, and then we will discuss. Sounds good. So I will. Um, I'll just read like a short section that's right around from the the first third or so of the story. Uh, we don't need very much preamble, but which is the case with most short short stories. But the the only thing that has sort of happened at at the start that. I'm skipping over just a little bit is, is the opening context. context. So um, the main character here is Lori, uh, whose husband Tim has died rather suddenly um, and um, une unexpectedly. And at this point in the story, she is sort of tasked with going through all of his things so that they can be divided up uh, with the rest of his family. And so his family is waiting on her so that they can, you know, sort of come in and swoop, uh, pick up some of their own things that they want. And as well, uh, upon his death, they've discovered that they're, they're quite a bit in debt. And uh, part of the uh, working through all of that has fallen to Lori as well. And um, there's a little bit of tension growing from Tim's side of the family. So at this point in the story, Lori is just home alone going through uh, this sound equipment that uh, Tim was a sound engineer and Tim's mother, mother comes over for a visit and that's just where we'll, you know, we'll kick off this scene. Uh, and the mother's name is Deborah. So it's Lori, uh, whose husband Tim has died and her mother-in-law is Deborah. I got your message, Deborah said, pretending not to stare at the mess. Should I put on some coffee for us, she asked. Sure, that's fine, Lori said. She began gathering up some of the clutter and discovered that the garbage can was already full. She pulled the edges of the plastic bag up, tried to cram more inside. Neither spoke while Deborah rinsed the coffee pot and then filled the sink while the coffee maker began to sputter and hiss. Do you have any boxes for me to take since I'm here? Deborah asked, drying her hands. Thanks for doing those, Lori said. And no, no boxes yet. Deborah sighed through pursed lips. In one slow motion, she took off her glasses and started to rub the lenses with the bottom hem of her shirt. I'm about out of patience here, Lori. You won't let us come in and take anything, but you're not doing any of the, uh, any of the work. Not all of this stuff is for you. He has family who wants to remember him too, his sisters, his nephew, not to mention me and Gary. She folded the moist, moist tea towel in half and draped it over the handle on the oven door. And then there's the money side of it. None of us knew how badly in debt he was, the both of you were. 
we're trying not to leave you with all of it, but if you don't want our help, then I know all this. You're not helping me by dredging it in front of my face. I can't just pack him up into boxes and be done with it. It doesn't work that way. Not after what he meant to me. This part isn't up to you. I knew him better than any of you. Lori's face was getting hot and red. Her throat felt blocked, a growth of pain trying so hard to claw its way up out of her and spew over the world she'd been left with. Deborah sighed. After one more breath, she reached into the cupboard and took out two mugs, filled them with the coffee. If we sell his equipment, then we can make a real dent into the credit cards. The loans are more complicated, but have more wiggle room, she said. She handed the mug to Lori. I've been working on that. I'm going through the computer, making sure that there isn't anything we should keep or anything useful even. I might find someone to sell all the gear to among all his projects and contracts and stuff. We can't sell that computer without knowing what he left on it. Okay, Deborah said. She blew on her coffee. That sounds fair. Is that what you wanted to show me? No, not exactly. Sort of related though. Lori took a gulp of coffee, didn't react when it burnt her tongue in her throat. Come around here, I'll show you on the TV. She hurried around the corner and started picking up remote controls. There were seven laid out on the coffee table. They were the only things in the room not coated in dust or crumbs. The first show Tim made me watch with him was I Love Lucy, she said. His grandfather used to watch that with him when he was little, Deborah said. The two of them would laugh themselves stupid. I never found it all that funny, she said. It still made him laugh, even though he'd seen it over and over, but that wasn't why he wanted to show it to me. He said it was the reason he got into sound design. We watched a few episodes that I could hear how the husband, Ricky, laughs. They were husband and wife in real life. He loved telling me stuff like that. She took a sip of coffee and Deborah refilled her mug and came back. Anyway, as you probably noticed, if you've seen it, the actor who plays Ricky has a very distinct, very loud laugh. At first I thought it was obnoxious and just that it was bad acting. There's no way someone really laughs like that. But then Tim showed me a bunch of scenes that he's not in, but you can hear that laugh in the background. He's just part of the audience and laughing his damn head off. It's unmistakably him. And Tim always thought it was so sweet that you could hear how much he enjoyed watching his wife perform. That to judge by that sound, he was the one she made laugh the hardest. That's so sweet, Deborah says. Sounds just like the thing he would latch onto. I know, when he first told me that, I almost cried. He just filled my heart. It was such a tender thought. Anyway, listen to this, Lori said. She had on the TV and the whole sound system turned on. She flew through the PVR menu and clicked play on something so quickly that Deborah didn't see the name. A sitcom appeared on the screen, people sitting around a kitchen table. This is a night with Lucy, she said. No, just listen, wait till the end of this joke. Deborah stayed quiet, but kept her eye on Lori, who stared clean through the TV screen. When the laugh track started, she cranked the volume knob on the expensive speaker unit. Deborah winced, spilled her coffee as she brought one hand over her ear. There, Lori shouted. Can you turn it down, please, Deborah said, setting the mug down, shaking coffee off of her fingers. Listen this time, listen to the laugh, okay? I won't turn it up so loud. She kept, skipped back a few seconds and let the laugh track play again. Did you hear it? I don't know what you mean, Lori. The laugh, listen to the laughing. She reversed again, let it play back, raised her eyebrows expectantly at Deborah. That's Tim's laugh. Clear as day, she said. Deborah didn't say anything. This is just the first one I found. There's also this one, Lori said, going back to the PVR menu and selecting another recording. She played that one, again, queued up to a spot with a joke, a laugh track which sounded much the same as the previous one. Did you hear it that time? She dropped the remote on the table and picked up the DVD case. Now here's where it gets really strange, she said, popping the disc into the player. Those other two are pretty recent. Newer shows that probably use the laugh track from the same digital library. They don't actually record the audience for those laughs. But then I had this on in the background while I was going through Tim's computer. And listen to this one. She kept to, skipped to a particular episode and then a later scene, fast forwarding until a particular spot. She handed Deborah the DVD case before she hit play. It was the fourth season of Saturday Night Live. Lori pushed play. There it is again. Tim's laugh. But it's a different recording this time. It lasts a little bit longer, but it's still him. I'm sure of it. I don't understand, Lori. First, I don't hear it, but it can't be him. He didn't work on shows like this. I don't remember him ever saying he was making laugh tracks, but even if he did, why would he be one of the people laughing? 
And this show, Lori, this is from the 70s. Look, she said, turning the case over, scanning the fine print. Right there, 1978. Tim wasn't born yet. It's him, Lori said. I know him. I know that sound. That is him laughing. It is. I don't know what to say, Lori. I don't think you should be doing all this work alone anymore. Can I please come help you go through some of these things? We're out of time as it is. And you really shouldn't be taking on all of this yourself. You really don't hear it. No, sweetie, I don't hear it. I wish I did. I would give anything to hear him laugh like that. Believe me. No, you believe me. That's him. I don't know what it means, but that's him. Maybe he did work on those shows. Maybe he did the sound for the DVD, like a remaster. Maybe someone out there worked with him on something we don't know about. There might be a project that he never finished. Or maybe it's something else, just something left behind. He left so little of his actual self behind, she said. Her eyes stung and she was quick to swipe the wetness away. Thanks very much. Yay, thank you. Thank you, Keith. Um, so I think as I think as everyone said, could sort of hear there, this story is very scenic, right? There's a lot of dialogue, you're thrown into this world um, without a lot of narrative explanation, you're just there. Um, why was that so important to you here? Um, uh, I think that's a very astute observation. <laughs> um, I think it was important to sort of feel out of place to to be to be putting pieces together because that's essentially what Lori is is doing that she's jumping in trying to go through um bits and pieces of the part of Tim's life she doesn't really know like she doesn't understand the sound equipment when she starts playing with it when she starts going through computer files like she doesn't actually know how they work or what they do but she is combing through everything in the hopes that she's going to put something together um and so i think for the reader to start off as well just sort of discombobulated and expected to sort of look and you're right like it's it is quite scenic and a lot of the description is sort of making you look around and see the room mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of ways where i'm ho i'm hoping the the reader is seeing Lori's reality more than she is a little mm -hmm. bit I, I think that's part of yeah. what I was going with in the story as well oh, yeah that's definitely there you know you just said something um that made me think um that you know Lori doesn't understand Tim's job right which is a very common scenario that many of us don't understand the jobs that our closest friends and family members uh, are spending so much of their time working on right so mm -hmm. I mean there's, there's so much uh, there's hours like the majority of um, everyone's life is like a mysterious thing that um we, that we don't understand about the people closest to us um one of the uncanny things about this story, and there's a there's a, a lot of intrigue here. So, uh, and maybe um, maybe this was caught in the reading you did. It certainly it it uh, builds to this. Um, but the way other characters respond to Lori um, is particularly disorienting, right? We we feel their mistrust of her, their suspicion of her. We have a lot of uh, questions. It's very uncanny. And so um, on the one hand, you know, this story is realist. The scenario is plausible. It's written in that realist register. On the other hand, um, there are, you know, some, some elements of the uncanny and of horror here, which of course is something that mm. you work in. So um, what draws you to that, to, to the uncanny, to horror? And, you know, is there a sort of uncanny wash to this more realist story? Mm -hmm. um... Yeah, um, I am definitely, I would self-describe as, as a horror writer. It's definitely what I'm most interested in. Um, and yeah, this, this story is meant to sort of have like a little bit of an uncanny or just like a slightly off feel. It's supposed to be weird. Um, and, and part of that is, I, I think a little bit comes from Yes, the mistrust of the other characters and that they're they're certain that they're missing something about what Lori's doing. Um, and that puts you in a place too for for her perspective where uh, no one believes her. And so you're sort of stuck with this um, like and it, whether or not the reader believes her is sort of part of of the tension of the story as well. and that, I, I think lends a lot of like the the unsettlement or the dread to it. Um, 
and because just because of uh, the nature of like what the actual emotional core of the story is of of the uncanniness of someone just being gone uh, is is a very odd and disorienting uh, experience in in real life and it does make the rest of the world not feel real uh, mm-hmm. it does all of a sudden have this performativity that mm-hmm. this this little bit of of what you're seeing is not what anyone else is seeing mm-hmm. um, and I really like um, what stories like that can do in terms of awake, awakening an emotion in the reader that maybe they're not they wouldn't get just from straight up saying oh it's sad story is sad <laughs> right um and even like with horror and something being scary like it's more more the pickup of dread um of, of something being off and, mm-hmm. and not knowing how to how to put it right mm-hmm. um i think that's something that i i really enjoy um as as a, as a reader and as like an absorber of other art, so something um, that has occurred to me during the pandemic because I've been reading lots of horror stuff and other thinkers on horror and something that just clued in uh, and made perfect sense to me is that uh, I've always been like a pretty anxious person and it tends to be anxious people who really like dark okay. horror. And um, what I read was um, that essentially uh, the horror movie proves that you thinking of the worst scenario that you were right yeah. um, it really could be this bad <laughs> and so you sort of if, if you're quite anxious you sort of go through the worst case scenario all the time anyway mm-hmm. and you're sort of always ramping up and preparing for that and when you watch a horror movie it's just like you know it is going to be the worst case scenario you can just sit back and let it happen you're just like, I told you yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think, you know, in the story, it's not, um, it, it's very felt, right? It's not offering you, or it's not, it's not rationalizing Laurie for you or tell, explaining Laurie's situation uh, for you or giving you the answer to Laurie's predicament, right? It's just placing you very, um, very strongly in a feeling, right? At, mm-hmm. th- throughout the whole story, um, which is, which is very powerful when you read the whole thing. And one of the, um, one of the disorienting things too, is that uh, Laurie, the partner, and uh, Deborah, um, Tim's mother, they seem to know two different Tims, um, right? They remember, and, and we know what this is like, right? We're, uh, we're different around different people. We're different around our family than we are around our friends. Different people draw out um, different aspects of us, but sometimes we're, you know, uh, scarily completely different, <laughs> different people, you know? <laughs> and, mm-hmm. you know, what does, that, what does that say about the idea um, of identity? You know, the story's organized around this silent, Abs- this absence right this absence mm-hmm. of a person but it feels it's an absent a, a present absence you know but what does that say about the idea of identity is identity that is it an idea mm-hmm. yeah i think i think it's very hard to put together the identity of somebody else mm-hmm. um and so that's something where but our own identities do impact the other the other people, and you're you're right. Like like you say, uh, especially with somebody very close, um, sometimes you do uh, discover how different they are around particular people, and especially with like a partner, like a husband, wife, or or just a long term relationship, and then the parents, and mm-hmm. especially if if you've been together with somebody for a long time, and it's a long time before you meet their parents, there can be a a, a shock. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, but, but yeah, I think a big part of the story and like a big part of why the absence was important to me or like, like Tim is just not in this story. Uh, There's no way for the reader to get at Tim. Um, there's no way to tell, um, if Laurie is right or Deborah is right, or if they're both right. Um, so there, like, there is this little bit where, um, everybody, else that he encountered got an impression of of Tim but mm-hmm. everyone's is incomplete and they're all di- incomplete in different ways mm-hmm. um and the the person themselves like they are the the missing puzzle piece and if they're if, if they have died and like that's just it's really really missing like very mm-hmm. profoundly missing mm-hmm. um and there's just sort of no way to get at it but mm-hmm. when you miss that person I think you you look you you try to put it back together 
Mm -hmm. um, you, you try looking for those other pieces. You try to find like, and as you like learn different aspects that you didn't know, you, you search out other ones. So mm -hmm. um, like Lori is, you know, certain she's gonna find something mm -hmm. that she didn't know existed in, in this mm -hmm. computer on these files in his old emails. That there will be something that is gonna make this clearer or make it easier. Um, yeah. And that's sort of her, her quest all the way through. Yeah, this was something I just loved about this story. And one of my, uh, this idea you're um, sort of working with here, and it feels true, but very complicated that Lori, um, she seems to be, uh, you know, unlike the other characters say, she seems to be really certain that she does know Tim, um, that she knows the real one, that she has the authority on the real Tim, um, mm -hmm. that she, uh, you know, can, can see all the way around him, has this sort of complete uh, knowledge of him and in, in the whole arc of his life and that disturbs her right that idea that she has a complete knowledge of Tim and what she's wanting is to find a mystery right she wants to find like a secret a dark secret something mm -hmm. um, something else it's such a great idea um, mm -hmm. but what made you you know it, it feels very true I mean what made you go mm -hmm. with that um well that is just something that that's sort of the only connection she has left. And if there is no mystery, then there's nothing left to do but divide up his stuff, give give his mom, get like give the rest of his family the things that they want, mm -hmm. um, and and to just sort of move aside and be done. And I think there is it, like everybody would handle it very differently when there's like a depth like close in the family. But there are these ways wherein we we resist the next step forward of like the, the moving on part where like if it even is moving on i think there's a lot of ways that it gets misconstrued of mm -hmm. there's like okay now it's done and like we're we're finished with it over mm -hmm. here now mm -hmm. um and so i think really at the core that that is what laurie is afraid of in terms of like it it just being done mm -hmm. um tim's gone uh there's and if if there's no mystery if there's if there's no rabbit hole to go down then what does she do right um, then it's all over yeah and it just it's something that would make it more more real i, mm -hmm. I imagine right like there's mm -hmm. um judith owens is asking something here i'll come back to some of my questions but i think i might weave in some audience questions as we go instead of saving them for the end maybe sure um judith owens is asking how important is a place or setting and evoking a sense of the uncanniness for you hmm um well, this this one is sort of an interesting example of that because the the setting is important, but the setting sort of centers around a non setting <laughs> of like claustroph listening. Quite claustrophobic, right? Yeah, uh, so it is very very small, um, and it's it's sort of um, Lori putting herself into a tighter and tighter box of mm -hmm. of sort of shutting the world out and and going down the rabbit hole of of like, I don't know, not to be too uh, video drone-y, <laughs> uh, but like she's diving into the computer screen or like into the, di the digital version yeah. of it. Like she's so absorbed with that, that she's sort of left the little bit of the outside world completely behind. Mm -hmm. um, and so in that sense, like the, the physical setting is, is very small and claustrophobic, but it needs to feel like, where she's putting her attention is endless that she could go down this hole forever mm -hmm. um and so i think yeah like in the in the uncanny for setting the tone like the setting in uncanny li literature i think is very important because it has to establish that that something is off mm -hmm. um there is something about the world that is different here and then that's where we start like we recognize it it looks like we should understand the rules we should know how this works mm -hmm. and then if Lori really does hear this laugh, then the, then the rules are broken, right? Then, mm -hmm. then, then we're missing something and we don't actually understand. And I think that's where like the, the slippage mm -hmm. is where the uncanny feeling comes from. And I think mm -hmm. the setting is most often what sets that in motion. Mm -hmm. There's something uncanny about, about the internet and our digital world. I'm thinking of, you know, it, say you're taking a break from your phone and you're trying to digitally purge and then you know you you walk around and the people around you are um are staring at their phones you know and and there and there's something uncanny about that right and the experience of looking at someone looking at their phone when you've decided not to look at your phone and you maybe mm. if you're 
you feel like stop, you know, uh, come back, come back to the world where I am, come back. But you know that their experience is is similar to the one you described, right? That they're in this ever expanding rabbit hole of war and of whatever of the of this internet, this infinite um, place that a digital universe feels like. But then, um, you know, it's not what it looks like when you're when you're looking at the person consuming it. Yeah, for sure. And it, like even in terms of uh, like new technology, always the, there will eventually be some crazy horror or ghost story that, that comes. And the internet has proven to be a really, really good one where there's just endless weirdness um, and uh, the ability to like make something that's not real look like maybe it is or um, you know, like the, the weird phantom YouTube videos, like that's a rabbit hole you can go down where there's like, there's these 25 hour long, like the sort of essentially static signals that are on YouTube that people watch and like there's certain like there's something in there. Right, or, right, right. Or, yeah, uh, we have these meaning, meaning making brains, right? We can find it. Yeah, uh, exactly. It and so the, the, the internet is, is very vast and like you're right, it has like this infinite, we keep adding to it. And yet the edges of it are all frayed and broken and just, yeah. sort of, just sort of dissipates. And that's a great place for your mind to get, to latch on to. Like, I'm going to figure that out. I'm going to, I'm going to put yeah. the pattern here to what's, what doesn't have one. Yeah. Yeah. You know, something that also struck me here, and this is just randomly, I just happened to read this recently, is that um, um, memory, the experience of memories are often quiet, um, mm -hmm. silent images, you know, but not usually not sounds in the experience of memory. I guess that, that book, All Quiet on the Rest of Western Front, is about this, the quietness of a traumatic memory. Mm -hmm. um, but here, um, it's not that that isn't how memory is experienced in this story in that familiar way, right? It, images coming to her flashbacks, whatever that's that never happens. It's always sound. Mm -hmm. um, and that in itself felt felt really interesting and disorienting to me. The fact that she experiences memory in this other way, differently from I think from the way from the way I do, I think mine would be more imagistic. Um, and then, you know, it's something about the permanence of the recordings people leave um, disturbs the way that we normally that, that we that we experience memory. Is there something in our technology um, that is out of sync with the way our minds work? Yeah, I think I. Um, um, yes. <laughs> um you know, i think that's really interesting because um, especially like as technology advances and we get like these better and better ways to record our memories of people right where we have we have videos we have text messages and um they seem so much more complete and yet they are still weirdly sectional and so it's sort of like not to be too like grim or whatever you know like the the, the museum thing of like the, the horse that's cut up and all the glass yeah. and you, you pull the one section out and it mm -hmm. seems like it's such great detail and it's, it's encapsulated so much and yet the whole of it like you can't, any one of those one sections is just not going to show you what yeah. what it actually is and yeah. I think our current technology feels more complete because it's it is like we can watch someone you know like in a video and we can remember the way that they walked or you know those intangible and it sets off those intangible memories like um um like like that or or um smell and taste and like things that aren't in uh that little bit of technology mm -hmm. um but it's also very fragile and then especially like i think it's something that we're still in the midst of um taking advantage or um taking for granted rather um what we're trying to save and then not actually saving it so like um everything sort of like goes to the cloud now but if you like if you lose your access to it you just lose all that stuff yeah, yeah. or it gets deleted or um if if you don't use the cloud and it's all on a phone then you break that phone mm -hmm. and everything that's on there is gone but it felt like we were doing this great you know up-to-date recording of our life yeah. and it, it's just it's very easily snuffed out even like the internet itself feels very big but there's yeah. a couple of pretty small strategic things that could just make it all disappear yeah yeah um, yeah there's a kind of there's a the, the, the everything feels the internet feels very um 
permanent and omnipresent, but then also it's very, I guess it's, it's very tenuous too. Eh? It's very, mm -hmm. it's very fragile. So uh, from some of the, I would keep asking you about technology because on the one hand, the story is very conceptual, right? And you're dealing with, um, with concepts. And I, I think a lot of people who write in kind of um, horror um, speculative modes are interested in these kinds of concepts and they often, you know, are interested in odd scenarios and ideas might spark a story, but it's also a very moving story and the, and the, you know, it's deeply felt the characters are very, um, are, are very interesting and you feel for them. And so I wanted to know, and this is sort of related to a question that Candace Ball has, um, here i wanted to know what comes first for you um concept character rhythm of the sentences or are they all you know ideally unified that's what you want but and candace is asking um what are some of the plotting or character challenges that you had to overcome sure um so this yeah you're right and and i'm definitely one of those writers who i'm, I'm drawn to like a very odd small instance or or like something that that seems very um, niche or that that I can go down the rabbit hole and start researching oh I'm neat and then I'll start looking more and more into it so this very much started with um, uh, late, late later in the story there is mention of this device that's called the Charlie Douglas laugh box um, which was an old Hollywood thing um, so I, like I mentioned I love Lucy which had had an audience and that was like that was the very first show that was recorded to be uh, replayed. So it was the first show that had reruns. Um, and there's like, there's laughing, but that's, that's pretty much just the crew. Uh, and so it's, and the, they, they do manipulate it and add it in, but uh, shows like that started to become more, it, it, it became very obvious to producers that um, if you could tell the audience when to laugh, they laughed harder and they enjoy, people enjoyed watching shows where other people were laughing more. So they started figuring out like, well, we'll, we'll film everything in these big studios and we'll bring in audiences and that sort of to get more and more unruly. We're like trying to have a hundred people. Um, and then if, if it's a real audience, they don't always respond the way you want and you can't manipulate it. Uh, so this sound engineer, Charlie Douglas, uh, made this machine uh, where he recorded individual laughs one at a time and ran them through this like very early sound processor where he mixed them all together um, and he was he, like he was the only person doing it so it was like a proprietary technology that he would go from studio to studio and he would sort of custom make them a laugh track for their show mm -hmm. um, and then apparently uh, it's been digitized and these files are still the same laughs that get used in laugh tracks now like now it's just digital library it's the exact same thing and I just thought that was such a weird idea of, of it being assembled piece by piece from each individual laugh. Like that to me felt very uncanny mm -hmm. that, uh, that he'd be able to pull out any particular one. Mm -hmm. And so you that that's this person's laugh. And like maybe he had recorded who, who it was. Um, and mm -hmm. so that sort of bred into the idea of, of hearing someone that shouldn't be there. Yeah. Um, and like you were saying with with Lori um being certain that she knows Tim the best like uh recognizing someone's laugh out of a crowd is is like sort of one of those those things where like that would prove it and like, that proves it to her that she hears the laugh and she knows it. she knows it better than anybody else mm -hmm. she knows it's there mm -hmm. um but for anybody else it would be impossible mm -hmm. to hear it um yeah like even like even for his mother so like that's read more as uh, skepticism that his mother doesn't hear it but if you were to like even one of Tim's friends like in theory they wouldn't know his laugh as well as she did to be able to pick it out to that yeah yeah um, I'm gonna try I'm gonna try and relate this conversation on laughs to Jonathan Ball's question about Baudrillard but he's he's it's about <laughs> honor, it's about it's, yes summarize all of Baudrillard Keith no, yeah. <laughs> it's, about, it's about um it's about objects and you know objects having a life of their own or objects um uh, do objects, are, are we attracted to objects and desire them? Do objects have an attractive force? Do they have desire? And what's a, like, what's a laugh on a laugh track? It's this human trace, I guess, but also an object. It's, this, you know, maybe this sort of hybrid thing. So um, are, is, is that another way of producing uncanniness here is giving objects like a laugh track, a kind of life? Sure. I, and I think, yeah, like in this context, like the, the way we're 
the way we're looking at it, I would say that the laugh track itself is this sort of odd object. And so that is something um, that that Lori is is sort of doing that she's assigning this sort of tangible objecthood to to things that are more or less intangible that there's no way to get that laugh but she's like she's gonna like she's gonna find this way to grab it and hold it and and have it um and that is sort of like uh, yeah, like tim has an object as well and so like there's this the tim that she misses um is is her object of desire and it, it has this mm -hmm. force it's pulling her along yeah um but, yeah, is a yeah is a memory now an object right is it suddenly mm -hmm. and yeah yeah, so like all these different intangible things sort of end up having the same kind of draw as an actual object and they're, they're being treated and pursued as as objects. So they're, they're sort of this self-fulfilling prophecy of that, that's not what they are, but by by treating them that way or by seeking them out in that way, we are giving them that, that status. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's that's quite interesting. And so like in terms of like the actual box or like the, a real object in the story would be the box that she ends up, um, the, at the, as the story goes, we find out that Tim knew what it was and that he wanted it. Um, and so that in turn, like that becomes his object desire and it sort of transfers over to her and she starts absorbing mm -hmm. traits of, of him like yeah. in, in this pursuit. But, Jonathan's saying, if it's a horror story, is the laugh track the monster? Maybe. Oh, maybe. Kind of, it kind of does act that way. And Judith is, um, Judith uh, is making a remark here about the relationship between technology and memory, um, and the limit, the ways that it might uh, limit our imaginative capacity. This is somewhat related to what you were saying about. Um, uh laugh tracks just the fact that we laugh along when there is a laugh track and we shouldn't feel guilty about that we're social animals we're gonna laugh and other people <laughs> laugh and yawn when other people laugh. it's okay it's okay but um is there you know judith is saying if you hit replay over and over on a recording you hear the same thing but when you remember something over and over again it might take on different inflections you might remember it uh differently you know over the years or from time by time and so um does technology that kind of accuracy that technology can guarantee us does it dimin diminish our capacity um our imaginative capacity hmm. that that's really interesting i would i would love to have a really good conceptual answer for that but it's actually it's just such an interesting thing to, to chew on and sort of think about because yeah i think uh, especially like by bringing the technology of something like a tv show which is sort of you know like that's always at the surface of this one so so something like that would be how you remember a show um that you haven't necessarily memorized but that you really like and then if you were to like so say like you remember your favorite line and and what was like it, it was just the funniest thing or it struck you at just this moment and you remember it for a long time and then maybe quite a long time later you actually re-watch that episode and it's different and it's, mm -hmm. it doesn't occur quite how you remembered it like i've i've had that happen to me quite a few times that i've, I've misremembered mm -hmm. lines and then i've often thought when i've gone back and watched it that that my version was bad <laughs> but the one that I faultily remembered was funnier and punchier. But it, um, <laughs> so I, I think that's a really interesting prompt about like there is absolutely a difference between the the memory and the 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 like set in stone object and the technology keeps it exactly as it was and. Mm -hmm we change around it and then so when we when we go back to it it feels as though it has changed and it hasn't and, and books are are the same way as well that they they're very static um in reality but when you read a book at different stages in your life you remember it differently mm -hmm. there's, mm -hmm. there's and maybe just because books are longer um and the way we absorb it is so different but no one sort of expects to mm -hmm. read a book another time and for it to be exactly the same like you mm -hmm. reread re them to see something different mm -hmm. um and maybe re-watching our favorite shows we we aren't doing that what we want is for it to be exactly the same 
Um, and that's something I've, I've even been reading about a little bit in, in terms of the pandemic that like lots of people are rewatching the same things over and over uh, because yeah. it takes away this sort of anxiety about everything else in their life is so unpredictable. But right. you can watch The Office again and The Office yes. is the same. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but in terms of like whether that is limiting your imagination, I'm, I'm sort of intrigued by that now because mm -hmm. it's sort of a coping mechanism when you're having to use your imagination to essentially survive and to, mm -hmm. to navigate everyday problems, your, your yeah. imagination is being used all up, um, just staying afloat. Mm -hmm. uh, so then when it comes to experiencing art, it's like you need the rest and you sort of need to shut the, the thinky part of your brain down. And, yeah, and, and, and grief, grief limits your imagination, right? Like Lori's grief, grief limits mm -hmm. your imagination and, and those traumatic experiences limit your imagination. Um, at least for a time, right? For, for a while. Yeah. Um, so you also, uh, you have this, uh, Tim is this uh, sound engineer, the sound designer. He's got this really interesting job. Uh, you live with a, a musician, Lindsay, mm -hmm. to whom this chapter yep. is dedicated. Um, so what is the experience of um, living with someone who's also an artist, but who works in a different medium, a sound medium? Um, yeah, that would be sort of, uh, sort of like Lori's own situation of like not really knowing everything that she does. <laughs> um, but yeah, Li Lindsay does do a lot of production. And so like, I've seen her working on stuff. And it's, it's not quite the same because she's not doing sound effects or anything. She's just music. Um, but she's had to learn all those back end things, all those, those, uh, recording programs and, Mm -hmm. and everything and she's quite proficient with it and so these the trailers that that Epe was sharing on social media uh Lindsay did all the sound for those oh, wow. so it was this interesting uh thing where we actually got to work together and and collaborate on something that touches on what's in the story mm -hmm. um but yeah mostly I don't understand a lot right. of her work <laughs> it's, has, it's has, quite... it, has learning about music has it influenced your writing um I suppose um uh, I I am a very bad musician. Also, I used to play bass in a couple of bands a long, long time ago. So um, music has been around for a long time. I used to um, get a lot of prompts from from song lyrics. I used to often would have those as a jumping off point. Um, yeah, but in terms of like, I, I don't have a lot of complex knowledge about about music and so that's something where like that would be a part of like I can see Lindsay working but in terms of like am I actually getting what's going on uh, no right. <laughs> and I think that that's true of like if if you have a if, if you're both if you're part if you're an artist and you're a partner with uh, an artist who works in a different medium I think she would say the same thing for uh the way I I write and just the process of how it works and when it appears that I'm working and when it appears that I'm not is not always um, indicative of what's actually going on and what's getting fixed, what's getting done mm -hmm. kind of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of other mediums too, I just want to show um, people if they haven't picked up a copy yet that um, the chapbook has lots of these lovely um, paintings um, in it and they come at moments um, that are quite, you know, they come at these emotional peaks and or at least you know they, they come at these emotional peaks so they give me they give you an experience of an emotional peak when you um come to one of these paintings it kind of gives you an opportunity to slow down and pause and linger over um something that was going on in the previous page mm -hmm. did you have anything to do with these paintings did you choose them did you um i did not i knew they would be in there uh, that was like part of the series but those were done by matt jodry at mm -hmm. uh, at at bay press and uh i saw them at uh, at the layout stage mm -hmm. um so I, and I, I i agree that i think they appear at these really great pivotal emotional moments and that's something just to go back to what we were talking about the form earlier and with like a shorter story trying to give it the space to land emotionally. I think mm -hmm. the paintings really work well uh, it, it, like to, towards that because um, as, as, you, as we've been saying, like you try to put meaning behind what you're seeing. So, so you look at it and you're like, well, why this painting right now? Mm -hmm. And then you start to, to really think about what has just happened uh, mm -hmm. what is the emotional resonance of of the dialogue that i've just read mm -hmm. and i think that's a great way to like 
just slow down and yeah. sort of absorb the story in a, in a slower pace and to, to not just sort of fly through it. Because it, it's, it's short, like it's, it is just a short story. It's not super yeah. long. Yeah. Um, but I really like um, that this form in particular uh, sort of encourages this sort of slower, more cerebral approach to it. And I think it complements this particular story well. It's, it's couldn't, couldn't have gone better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah no i i think um i think the paintings were just great i think that they uh, yeah they they give you pause and they help your feelings expand in that moment um joanna is asking going back to the relationship between memory and technology i've also heard that your memory will fill in any gaps that it has with content that makes sense to you um so in this way it can solidify and protect your own perceptions of people and the world maybe maybe if, even if they're unreal perceptions, but the relenting accuracy of technology would threaten that, couldn't it? Is that part of what's happening to Lori at the end of the story when she's watching Deborah's home movies? Ooh, Ooh I like that too. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think what's sort of happening at the end to me, I think is uh, that Lori does sort of get her wish that like there is a little bit of a mystery left, that there is, there is some some aspect of Tim that she didn't know, but I don't know that it's satisfying for her to to learn this. And it's like it, it's you know got that that great staple of short stories where like you can just sort of leave the resolution hanging. You don't you don't have to. Ooh, I don't know. <laughs> what do you think happened? To the <laughs> um, but yeah, I think there is. Um, it does challenge Lori's assertion that she knows Tim the best. And at the very least, it doesn't necessarily knock her off the pedestal in terms of like, you weren't as close as you thought, but mm -hmm. it does make space for Deborah as well. Uh, and it mm -hmm. just sort of, it opens up and, and shows that maybe it's not as restrictive as, as Lori was thinking and that Deborah's version is just as valid mm -hmm. um, and sort of, also needs to be dealt with and where uh if Lori is looking for this aspect about him that like there's got to be something else I don't know uh, and then, then there is like there is a whole life before her essentially where mm -hmm. she can have tidbits about it but she, she doesn't know she doesn't yeah. know that Tim and yeah. Deborah may not know Lori's Tim mm -hmm. but Lori doesn't know Deborah's Tim yeah, that was really, that came across very powerfully. And it also, it really made you start to uh, think about how you, how we experience love, right? Like, um, and people have thought about this, but to what degree is the experience of love, the experience, I mean, you want it to be a full experience of this other person, but to what degree is it sometimes an experience of the self? It's a very scary mm -hmm. question, yeah. you know? Um, but that's the place the story, I think, brings you to, you know, to what degree is Lori's experience of her love an experience of another person or an experience of herself? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, oh, Judith is saying, uh, oh, do the, do the paintings, uh, she says she hasn't picked up the book yet, so she hasn't seen the paintings yet, but do the paintings invite you to go back over what you've just read to see something different in the story? Well, they certainly could. <laughs> I think they, they come well because they, they do sort of appear at places that have natural breaks. Um, like they're often scene cappers or like right after something later has happened. Um, yeah. So I think so. And I, I really liked um, sort of reading it, reading in detail and then uh, like sort of looking at how the paintings are changing. So like the, the, the composition of the paintings change throughout the story and then so like I was doing like even though I wrote it I was like ooh okay what what's being reflected here and um trying to sort of track how how the the images are responding to what's happening in the story and because there's such abstract images like what I'm seeing and what I'm relating as you know the visual representation is going to be different for other people right so like where like there's swirly strokes and then there's like these garish sort of Mm -hmm. straight lines cut through and so there's for me mm -hmm. um i'm assigning sort of mm -hmm. emotional value to those and like well what like the jagged lines were mm -hmm. getting at this but that's going to be different for everybody else and i really like uh that that possibility and that's something like i was saying about rereading books um that might be if you if you don't look at this for a long time and come back to it 
um, remembering what you thought the paintings meant, mm -hmm. uh, they might be different on another go around mm -hmm. later. They don't feel, they're not tranquil. They're not like tranquil um, paintings, right? They're quite, um, they're vivid, even though they're in black and white, they're vivid and they're quite stark and they seem, you know, uh, the feeling is, is one of disturbance, right? Of the, mm -hmm. of the paintings, yeah. Um, so we're almost running out of time um, here, Keith, but I just wanted to um, to talk about a little bit about William Shatner. I don't know if you've seen William oh. Shatner. He's recording this hologram. Have you seen this? This hologram. <laughs> um, this very, very like in-depth, complicated, complex hologram that he's spending a lot of time recording. William Shatner, who looks just terrifyingly young, even though he's now in his nineties. Um, <laughs> but this hologram that that can you know continue on after he's died. Um, is it, it, are people going to be doing this, Keith? Is your little writerly intuition? What are you? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. It's certainly like it's part of our media already. Like, there's a lot of jokes about this happening. Like, there's on Community when Get Chevy Chase's character is dead, he turns up as a hologram. Oh. Um, on the show Superstore, they they have like there's a which is like a stand-in for Walmart, and their oldest floor worker is fired because she's too old and then they replace her with a hologram that looks just like her <laughs> and and greets people at the store right. uh, so it's something where we seem to be fixated on it at the moment like whether or not it's going to continue forward would be like the sort of a fascinatingly terrifying idea could but, you have uh, a relationship with a hologram i hope not that would be odd <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, and then there's like, there's that Black Mirror episode where uh, with the, the, the AI that can uh, read someone's texts and then can can write new ones in their style, uh, which is apparently real service now. Um, right. That there are, uh, like, and like when you get AI to write a new Hallmark movie and then it's all very funny, but isn't it scary, the idea that you could feed it someone's text messages throughout their life and that it could then approximate what their answer would be. Right. Um, so we're definitely playing with that idea of of making a fake version yeah. that, that will outlast the real the real person. And so like that's something again, like when we're talking about technology and memory, it, it on its surface, it seems like it would be very complete and like, oh, we'd almost have that person. Mm -hmm. But then like I have a feeling William Shatner's hologram is not going to look like 90 year old William Shatner. It's going to look like young William Shatner. But 90 year old William Shatner looks like young William Shatner, though. So. Well, so maybe it's already been done. Yeah, maybe he's already, yeah, he might already be a hologram. Right. But then, like, you could, um, it, it might be the version of William Shatner that he wants everyone to remember rather mm -hmm. than That's real right. William Shatner. Mm -hmm. So, in, in that way, like, it feels very complete and yet, um, easily manipulated manipulated or changed or mm -hmm. altered in some in some way or like we could change it ourselves like we could just make a better version of the people we like and we just wipe out things that we find annoying about them and just mm -hmm. take it out of their hologram and we don't need the real person yeah and then that and then who it you know it is it's almost like um uh you know kind of like the relationship we have with our pets right they're like real relationships you have a pet but also there's a bit of maybe projection going on there you're seeing what you need in the ex in the relationship with the pet you know um mm -hmm. and yeah yeah, sure. it, yeah yeah i do i do worry that we anthropomorphize the dog too yeah. much in his emotions yeah he seems, he, seems to to like, he seems to like it he seems to like it it's okay yeah <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I think we're gonna, we're basically at time now, but we have one last question from Jonathan Ball, who says, Guy Madden told me once that a company offered Roger Ebert his own voice after he'd lost it, put together from his recordings. He was horrified and refused it, supposedly. Wow. So yeah, that's sort of the same idea. Like, isn't that like, it seems like I'm sure when they brought that to Roger Ebert, they were like, what, a, don't, like, we have such a good idea. Aren't you excited? And he's just like, no. No, no. <laughs> But, but uh, like we have like a similar, like th that, it makes me think of putting dead actors into movies. Um, so mm. we have this, like putting Carrie Fisher back into Star Wars. And um, they they were doing it earlier, um, is there's, and it was Star Wars again, but one of the, I can't remember all the names and someone in the comments will say, but there was one of the older actors um, who had died before the new ones were made. And they said so they digitally put him in 
Rogue One. Um, but he's not alive anymore. <laughs> um, and just, yeah, the, we're sort of in that stage of things now where we don't even need the real actors. So if, the, if we do it for dead actors as a tribute, when do we start doing it so to replace the real actors? Like if you have an actor who has a prickly reputation, maybe you just use the robot version. You don't have to deal with them at all. And it's mm-hmm. sort of, it becomes very dystopic very quickly. So I'm, I'm glad Roger Ebert was, was horrified at this idea and didn't yeah. want to do it. That gives me some hope. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Judith says, or paid him. That's right, Judith, yeah. Yeah. Free labor with the robots. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you so much, Keith. Thank you for the wonderful reading. And um, it's a really, um, uh, I just want to see if this is a question from Brenda. Oh, yeah. Yes. You do. You must get the book, Brenda. Yeah, it's it's really, really. Um, it's great. It's it's both can it's both um, you know, uh, conceptual and very, very, very moving. One of those um, one of those stories that manages to do both things. Um, so thank you very much, Keith. Thank you, everyone. Are there any other questions, or does anyone want to give Keith a round of applause? Give him your little, um, your comments. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone. And great, great questions. Thanks so much for tuning in. Thanks. Thank you, Sayward. I was delighted to have you be my host. Oh, well, I was delighted. <laughs> I was delighted that you asked me. It was very fun. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for such thank an interesting uh, read. Pick it up, everyone. Oh, and John's back. There he is. <laughs> oh, you're muted. You're oh, muted. you're muted, John. Can't hear you. The joys of Zoom. So just a clicking sound that might be. Yeah, I can hear a click. (laughs) Wasn't sure which, who that was coming from. Can you hear me now? There it is. Yes. (laughs) Perfect. My, uh, my camera has apparently stopped uh, accepting audio, so I'm now using my computer's audio. Okay, <laughs> so that was a good bit, moment of uh, ghost in the machine eeriness to close down, <laughs> nothing else. I'd uh, like to express my sincere thanks to uh, you, Sayward, for your inimitable hosting. Thank you very, very much for coming on board for this evening. Uh, again, as a reminder to everyone, her uh, collection of short stories, even That Wildest Hope is spectacular and available at the bookstore. Uh, huge thanks to you, Keith, for writing such an incredible book. In keeping with the uh, the sound that we've been talking about, it is such an incredibly resonant read. It's one of those books that kind of just lurks and uh, haunts your brain for hours after you've read it. So, And it's also a book that very much rewards rereading. So if you do have an opportunity, please do pick up Signal Decay. Uh, again, we have signed copies, which Keith has very kindly signed. So those are available at the store. I'd like to thank all you in the audience, uh, both here in the webinar and uh, on YouTube watching now and again, in keeping with the uncanny uh, technology we've been discussing in the future, as this video will remain live on YouTube. So if you'd like to revisit any of this conversation or if you'd like to share it with anybody who wasn't able to make it this evening, please do feel free and uh, go ahead and do so. Thanks again to Matt Jodry of At Bay Press and uh, to all of you for your incredibly insightful questions and all of your commentary. It's been a real pleasure spending the evening with all of you. So please join me one more time in a silent yet virtual acknowledgement and celebration of Keith Kadu and his new book. Thanks so much, everyone.